everyone and thank you for joining us here today at the World um, uh, Sustainable Development Summit 2022. The uh, theme for the WSDS Summit this year is Towards a Resilient Planet, Ensuring a Sustainable and Equitable Future for All. Um, with that background about the WSDS, I now uh, welcome you all to the uh, plenary session on the Media Colloquium. Uh, which is on the role of communications as means for shaping public and political perceptions and attitudes on climate action. So um, with that, I will turn the platform on to uh, Mr. Vikram Chandra, founder of Editorji. Uh, with his address, we will also then have speakers for the plenary session who are Ms. Fiona Harvey, environment correspondent from The Guardian, Ms. Bahar Dad, environmental journalist and conservation biologist, Mr. Himanshu Shekhar Mishra, Senior Editor, NDG, NDTV. Ms. Jayashri Nandi, Environment jo Journalist at the Hindustan Times. And Dr. Rajiv Chipper, the Vice President of External Affairs, Sahajan Medical Technologies. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chandra, could you take forward the platform? Thank you. Thank you so much, Meher, and it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to be part of a, of a panel of such, such great luminaries in the environment uh, communications field. You know, I think it's, a, it's almost a tautology, it's an obvious thing that if the media, if mass media, if in our communications, if we could talk a little bit about the issues that really matter, if we could talk about climate change, if we could talk about sustainability, if we could talk about the destruction that human habits uh, are doing to the to the to the planet um obviously there would be change there would be faster change there would be policy action life would look up the planet would probably be saved but it's not always quite as easy as that although i have to say things are starting to change you are starting to see articles being written programs being done movies being made which are starting to draw attention to some of the real real issues but by and large, it does get lost a little bit in the, in the noise. And whether you're on social media, whether you're on mass media, you seem to be spending a lot of your time on, on, on other issues, uh, PRP gathering issues, sensational issues, issues that will drive engagement. So one of the things that I would really like to ask the panel, and I will be throwing it over to them, is to try and get ideas as to how you can break out of this rut. Uh, I'm sure we've all just seen the movie, Don't Look Up, uh, actually, that almost summed it up really well as to how when you're going on talking about a crisis and saying the world's about to come to an end, it's a really major issue. But you it tends to get drowned out by just so much irrelevant conversation that may seem irrelevant to us out here. But that's where engagement comes from. That's where TRPs come from. So how do you how do you do it? How do you get people to start paying attention to the issues that really matter? And that includes climate change and it includes the environment. Um, one of the learnings that I would like to place before all of you, uh, as, as I toss it over to your, your individual comments is, how do you ensure that the messaging that you are putting forward goes out of its own echo chamber? I used to spend a lot of time in my previous roles on television uh, doing great, what I thought was great environment programming, right? And we used to say, oh, we're going to save the tiger and you're going to worry about plastic and we're going to do sustainability and we must draw attention to water and we would do all of that. And you had a lot of people coming and saying, that is such wonderful. That was such a wonderful program. I absolutely adored it. And then when you sat down and you scratched your head, you said, hang on, it was only watched by people who are already passionate about the environment, who are already concerned about climate change, who already want to save the tiger. And that therefore is not necessarily very helpful. Yes, it's again great in that echo chamber to be hearing back from so many people saying, you did a wonderful program, but the idea has to take it to the people who are a broader audience. There's no point in preaching to the converted. They're already converted. They already believe you've got to reach, to a, reach out to a broader audience. So one of the things that I had tried my hand at about a decade or so ago, more than a decade when I was in my previous role at, 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 at NDTV uh, and when I was on television was to say, let's try and get in a little bit of that same popular culture. Let's do things like telethons where you actually get film stars and you get in singing and dancing. Uh, Bappi Lairi, who passed away today, came and did a number of shows around this. He sang a song, sing This is the Greenathon and sang a song or two about climate. And, maybe that attracted a broader audience. 
to the audience that you are normally talking to if you are an environment reporter. Is that the solution? I don't know. Is the solution just to make a lot more noise? I don't know that the answer to that either. But these are just some thoughts that I'm going to leave our really illustrious panelists with as I toss over to them. So why don't we start? Why don't we start with you, Payana Harvey, environment correspondent at the Guardian uh, in London, one of the most respected publications there is in the, on, on the planet. Uh, what do you feel, Nasavi? What, 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 is, what is the right way to take this forward? Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and can I just say, first of all, what a, a great pleasure and privilege it is to be here with so many distinguished uh, journalists on, on the panel and moderating the panel. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I, I, I thought that was a, a great point uh, that you just made, actually. Um, I, I, I'd love to have more singing and dancing uh, in this. I think that would be uh, a great improvement and bring a lot of people uh, to the audience. Um, what I think we need to do um, is everything. Um, you know, all of the avenues that you just mentioned, um, we need to explore them all. Um, th there's no time left uh, to, you know, try to, to, to just do one thing anymore. Uh, there's no time to try uh, one method after another. We need to try all methods of reaching people at once now. And that encompasses every form of, of journalism and every form of human conversation, really, whether that is through creative industries and the media. You mentioned the film Don't Look Up. I think that was a valuable contribution, uh, whether that is in the more serious parts uh, of journalism, uh, where, you know, people go for, for to read long essays and so on, whether that is on television, whether it's on social media, uh, where, uh, you know, an awful lot of people now get their information from, and some of it, I'm afraid, is misinformation. We really need to be pushing this out across all forms of, of conversation, all forms of media, uh, and not just environment journalists either. Those of us who are environment journalists, we need to be educating our colleagues, uh, ensuring that, uh, for instance, when stories about health are in the media, uh, that we talk about some of the issues around the environment and health. Uh, when stories about the weather, obviously, are in the media, but also when stories like uh, stories about national security, for instance, climate change has a very big impact there. Uh, stories about food, stories about the price uh, of goods, the price of living, uh, stories about uh, people's lifestyles, uh, stories about wealth and companies and money and businesses. Um, we need to have an environmental component in all of these stories, really. Um, you know, sometimes I still read stories uh, for instance, uh, in the United Kingdom, I read stories about the rising cost of living uh, that don't mention the fact that food prices are affected by climate change, are being affected by, by climate change. That seems to me extraordinary. Um, we need to make sure that uh, climate change and other bi bi biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity crisis and other environmental problems are being reflected in across the board in all of our stories uh, not just environment stories uh, and not just in, in one media. I think this has got to be an all out effort from now. Thank you. All right, that's uh, that's given us uh, something to to uh, uh, think about. And we will, of course, come back to all of our panelists and and, and uh, understand further what they, what, what they were saying. Let me go across next to Bahar Dutt, the environmental journalist, uh, conservation biologist. Uh, she's actually been trained as a conservation biologist author of a recent book, Green Wars, Dispatches from a Vanishing World. Bahar, over to you. Any thoughts and insights you have? Well, Vikram, firstly, thank you so much for setting it up so well. These are the dilemmas we all face, uh, whether as environment or I should say non-environment journalists. And as Fiona said, every story is important. And in I think every story, there is, uh, you know, the the question of how do you get it out to people? How do you tell your story better? I believe a good story has the power to change institutions. It has the power to make governments fall. And not that every story has to be that, but 
a bad story lulls you into a state of inertia. And I see more and more of that happening. And I'd like to see environment journalism, which is hard hitting, which is impactful, which actually uh, makes a difference to the crisis out there. That said, I feel journalism itself is in a state of crisis. Uh, while we have you know, the access to social media, you are your own editor, you can put out your stories there, you don't have to go through the filter of an editor, you don't have to wait for him or her to clear the story. There are disadvantages to that as well. As Vikram pointed out that it ends up uh, seeming like we are in these echo chambers. Uh, so I, I, I've divided my, uh, you know, these few minutes of what I'm saying today into what's wrong and what can be done. So I just, I just wanted to share two slides because I think they capture really uh, what's happening to environment journalism very well and perhaps the dilemmas which each one of us faces while reporting. So if I can just uh, request you to share the slide. Now this is a story uh, which was coming out of Glasgow, which was the last, you know, uh, the last big climate conference that was held. I happened to be there. Jayashree was there as well. I, I, Fiona, I don't know if you were there, but um, I did, I, you were, I did see some of your stories as well. So I think most people with, were familiar with what was happening on the ground. But I, I wanted to show, share a slice of the headlines that were coming out of Glasgow, which you know, was being touted to be the last chance to save planet Earth. Uh, we say that in every conference, incidentally. But look at the contrast in the two headlines. This was the BBC saying, did India betray the vulnerable nations? And here in India, our newspapers were carrying a headline saying, major win for India in climate diplomacy as nations strike coal compromise deal. Um, so, you know, your news depends on which geographical region you were in. And um, for me, this has been the dilemma. Do I report as an Indian journalist or do I just report for planet Earth in the crisis facing us all today? And I think for me, the way out has been to focus on climate justice. And um, I do believe that while the BBC carried this uh, very uh, provocative headline that India betray vulnerable nations, um, you know, there is the politics of the developed versus the developing world. And I think willy-nilly as environment journalists, we too fall into that trap. Um, and it's happened to me as well while, you know, tracking the story. Uh, so for me, I'm what I'm doing here is being absolutely honest that how do we get out of this trap? How do we get out of the politics of developed versus developing to really report on the issues that affect all of us and the planet? Uh, the second slide I'd like to uh, just show here, if we can move to the second slide, please. Uh, how the media covers climate change. Now, I've had the opportunity to look at this first as a reporter who's going out there to report. And the second is in my avatar right now, where I teach communicating climate change to a bunch of university students. And if you track this, there are people who've actually tracked when does climate change reporting tend to spike. And this shows very clearly, typically around events. So the event could be a UN summit, or it could be a cyclone, which is, uh, you know, hitting the coast of India. In this case, this is Matthew Boykoff and his team. They uh, basically document uh, where when the media reports on climate change. So they'll use certain keywords and they'll put that into their research and their data and they come out uh, with these graphs. And typically what you can see from here is the spike happened right before Copenhagen where all the world leaders uh, arrived. We had Obama coming, we had our own prime minister going and uh, there was a lot of uh, expectation um, that, you know, that, that there will be a deal. And then there was 2015 in Paris. So I just wanted to share these two slides to just kind of set the context of, uh, you know, these are sort of uh, the dynamics one has to navigate uh, while reporting on climate change or perhaps the environment. And I have a number of solutions because, uh, Vikram, you did ask for solutions, but I'll keep that for the second half of the conversation because I know there are other speakers as well. All right, All right. fair enough. We will come to, come to the solutions uh, uh, a little later, but let's now hear from... Dr. Rajiv Chibber, who is Vice President, External Affairs at the Sergeant and Medical Technologies, been somebody who's been working in, in these areas for quite some time. So, Dr. Chibber, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Vikram. Uh, in fact, um, both Bahar and uh, Ma'am Fiona, uh, you know, touched on very important topics. In fact, uh, see, it's not the it's not the uh, you know the case around beating the bush. It's the case around talking about the very relevant 
channels through all systematic methodologies that you have so today if if uh, if uh, if i recall when when greenathon greenathon was happening or when terry did the lighting a billion lives campaign or when there were other uh, campaigns which were going on uh, the scenario was very different 10 to 12 years or 15 years back today if you look at it it's a metamorphosis change that has happened uh, you've not got the old tools which were there today social media and as uh, uh, you know bahar rightly said you uh, doesn't have to really filter through a lot of uh, levels it has to go very naturally and people need to be aligned to it now if you look at the topic the topic very pertinently talks about how we need to have a shaping of the public interest and how can that also make the policy makers talk about it today there are elections going on in india are we actually seeing that anyone talking about maybe healthcare we've got this Im entire covid 19 crisis which is going on followed by the two variants or in the last three odd years the the uh, floods which happened again in chennai or the kerala floods or we've got you know devastations in uttarakhand and and uh, you know mountains just falling like a pack of cards we've not even demanded these in uttarakhand we've not even demanded these in in states like uh, up where where you know we, we suddenly see these floods so you know the the entire summary needs to simmer down to the fact that it needs to have a very very coherent target audience and as fiona said let's use all channels let's use all mediums but also try to simplify it to the fact that that there is a coherent connect what is missing these days is we just talk about it and i i typically am uh, uh, you know talking from a corporate communications perspective altogether because most of you are from the media itself and when we try to link it uh, we try to link it from an all pervasive setup it, i i would want to speak to a business journalist i would want to see, speak to an environmental journalist i would want to speak to someone who's also covering health uh, you can actually see the impacts in all these sectors uh, but then again, we understand that there is a limited space in newspapers. There's a limited space with the uh, with you know TV channels. There's a limited space also now with with the social media mediums itself. Who would be talking about it and who would be listening about it? So we need to exactly you know split it in such a way that every medium is talking about the perils and imperils on a simultaneous basis, and that will majorly have to happen when it is going to have a political impact unless we have a political impact it's been 15 years that we've been talking about it it's been 20 years that you know the ipcc first report came out and uh, people talked about uh, the one level being more hit by the climate crisis we see it today again and again and again there are promises again there are coverages but nothing really is moving on so i feel messages right now that need to be very cohesively setup is is there an infrastructure availability which can really talk about it is there some uh, you know the media can be a part of the active mainstream development to really uh, imbibe such messages within the masses itself which is not and and very rightly what vikram said uh, at the start it just liquidates away when there is something new which happens Today there's there's a huge uh, you know furore on uh, you know a community we we talk about it but we then don't really talk about the other impacts that uh, that uh, are are looking at mankind. So I think um, cohesively and attemptively from a communications point of view, I would like to put it onto each and every desk for them to report. Uh, health is an example. I mean environmental health people. Would really, really not even understand the perils of environmental health. And uh, thanks to Jayashree and thanks to others, uh, just a couple of days back, we broke a news on how IPCC reported mental health as one of the imperils. People would not have even looked at it. And look at the, you know, I look at the hindsight of it. A couple of weeks back, we had a union budget which talked about uh, mental health. Today, we have an IPCC report which talks about the environmental health. Uh, impacts and mentioning mental health did we even have one parliamentarian tweeting about this particular fact i did not see a uh, parliamentarian tweeting about it so that's the kind of level of information that we really need to now uh, jump onto
Right, uh, Dr. Chibba, that, that, that's uh, really interesting and some points in that around do we only report on this in a time of a crisis is something I'll come back to. But now let me welcome a former colleague of mine, Himanshu Shekhar, uh, Mishra Senior Editor at NDTV. Uh, Himanshu, of course, NDTV, one of those organizations which has done a lot of work on the environment and around that. Uh, I remember in my previous Aftar having been very closely associated with programs like Save the Tiger or Greenathon or Swachh Bharat or, uh, you know, many others like that. What do you think mainstream media organizations can do to try and make an impact? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Vikram, sir. Uh, it's, one has learned so much as a television journalist just watching you on screen. And uh, after a long time, I have had this opportunity to interact with you. Uh, you know, uh, one point that you made that NDTV did this, NDTV did that, NDTV did lots of campaigns, but did all other channels also were doing that. See, the idea is that in India's democracy, there are four or five very important stakeholders who have to work in a very concerted way to make an impact. Now, among media platforms, we all know there are hundreds of news channels. Now, how many, how much coverage is being given to issues related with environment and climate change that NDTV has done? That's a culture we have tried to develop and it has had an impact. Uh, remember the Save Tiger campaign, of course, led to a considerable impact, policy action on the ground. And we now, that as a discourse, doesn't exist that a number of tigers, of course, has started increasing. Uh, as a journalist who has covered politics for more than two decades, I've always been thinking that actually India, in Indian democracy, there is the most important stakeholder is the government. Of course, the political parties would come next to it. And then the common people on the ground. And of course, media is there. And when I was covering these assembly elections, I think Rajiv sir made this point, and I was amazed that in many assembly segments that I went in Western UP, issues related with climate change, environment, are not part of the mainstream discourse. Uh, this is an issue which even voters are not talking about. Uh, now, remember in Indian democracy, an issue attracts a political party when they think that there is a, a mass base which is receptive to it. For example, in Western UP, I was told that this is perhaps one of those elections where farmers have emerged as a factor in elections. Now, then everyone is talking about in their manifesto promising ABC. If you see the manifesto of political parties, everyone is now talking about we will do this for farmers, that for farmers. Now, in these elections or any election that we have covered, and you have also covered but much more than what I have covered, uh, we rarely debate, brainstorm that, okay, this is one environmental issue which needs to be addressed, which interests the voters or the political parties itself. Uh, in parliament, for example, in last two years, how many debates have happened on climate change, for example, or on the disasters? I mean, in terms of frequency, I can tell you I'm covering Parliament since 2001 and the frequency, of course, has increased. I mean, I remember I was surprised that last session, the first debate, in fact, was on the flood incidents in Tamil Nadu and Chennai, uh, in Kerala. Uh, but, you know, largely, uh, what are the state assemblies doing? Do we even know what state assemblies are doing to deliberate on the challenges that exist on the ground in terms of uh, the impact of climate change. Now, remember, Vikram said, is one more important point that we're living in a time of pandemic. There's still a shadow of pandemic on top of us. And India has had to fight, combat at least more than 10 cyclones, very high intensity cyclones in 2020 and 2021. Now, I was stunned when the NDRF DJ in an interview told me that he has had to issue instructions to his men when Amphan, super cyclone Amphan, the first in last two decades, uh, hit West Bengal and Orisha. Uh, in May 2020, this is just one month after the lockdown had been imposed in India, there was one crisis, disaster that India was fighting, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, and then the another disaster uh, started moving towards India. And instructions had to be issued that COVID protocol has to be followed on the ground because the cyclone shelters that we had, you could only house 50% of their strength uh, for which they were created. So we saw more than 2 million people affected, $14 billion in losses, at a time when this, the ability of the Indian state actually to dole out relief was very limited. So remember, we have we were already fighting climate change and then the COVID-19 pandemic has actually aggravated the crisis at several levels, Vikram sir, in terms of hunger, in terms of poverty. Now, I have all the data. I will, of course, be sharing uh, it later in this program. But we do know that hundreds and millions of people in this world have become more hungry. Uh, in India, 230 million Indians they fell below the minimum wage ceiling as per the Azim Premji University report, which was deliberated and 
brainstorming parliament as well. So we saw that there are several challenges. The humanitarian crisis is growing. We are still not debating many of these issues that are happening on the ground. Now, one point that Rajiv sir made, and I think uh, you, you will appreciate it uh, perhaps much better as being part of uh, the media fraternity, is that media focuses more on incidents. If a disaster incident happens, uh, when there are reports that the tigers are disappearing, the numbers are falling, then everyone starts doing the tiger story. When a cyclone comes, we all jump on that. And we did, I think, in terms of media coverage, media has done fantastic work in terms of covering disaster incidents. When Chennai goes underwater, when Kashmir goes underwater, when Kerala goes underwater, when there's a landslide in Kerala, very extensive coverage is happening now. That is one very positive change, I would say, in media's outlook in the last four or five years. The frequency, the scale, intensity of media coverage has increased. Now, but there's one missing line, I think, which Rajiv sir also mentioned, but the fact that when the disaster is over, how much coverage we do to, a, to what has happened, what is the damage it has done. You know, it often happens when the tsunami waters go back, then we know that what is the extent of the damage. But in the post-disaster incidents, whether it is a climate change impact or a COVID-19 pandemic impact, uh, the uh, focus is not that much on, uh, relatively that much on the post-disaster phase or uh, as it was during the disaster. For example, in Amphan, for example, uh, remember these poor people living along coastal areas, more than 2 million people had to be evacuated. Now, these are poor people. Many of them were daily wage laborers. Now, they were living in relief camps. After the cyclone, super cyclone phase was over, uh, how many stories did the national media do in terms of uh, reporting on what are these 2 million people who were evacuated from their homes? Have they come back? Because there was one report I saw in 2021, more than 10 million Indians were affected from disaster incidents and 3 lakh houses were destroyed. How many houses have been reconstructed? What is the state of rehabilitation? Uh, are they getting compensation? Remember this debate in Supreme Court about compensating those who died during COVID-19. It was a very acrimonious debate with similar work in progress. And when I covered Kashmir floods, I had prepared a research paper which was published by Rathraj in an international volume, uh, calling for a legal right to compensation to disaster victims on the line of right to education, right to food security. So there should also be a right to compensation, especially to poor people. We do not know, we do not have data, Vikram sir, as to how many people who suffer from disasters every year in India get compensation. Remember, when a flood comes, it destroys the poor people's home the most. They get washed away first. It's not a concrete buildings which get washed away. And there was a home ministry report, and I'm still researching on this, that how disasters are actually perpetuating poverty uh, in the world, in the sense that in my village, in Bihar, uh, I, my, I was told I, I met large number of people before every year, the Nepal rivers flowing from Nepal, they flood the bordering districts, including my district in Bihar. And every year before the monsoon starts picking up, villagers will start packing their bags and they try and move away to the safer places. And whatever mega income they have, they make these kacha homes in my village. And every year the flood, monsoon floods come, they get, they wash away their homes. When they come back, they again have to rebuild those homes because they, and many of them don't have even land to make their own homes. So there is a perpetuation, the vicious cycle the disasters are actually are putting in place. But unfortunately, the political culture, I mean, I, I propose that India needs a new politics. India needs a new political culture, which is far more sensitive to the issues that we are discussing now. If the political parties, the governments, the state governments, Parliament of India, the state assemblies, they all have to work in a very concerted way to actually create effective policy action on the ground. NETV has always shown the way, and I you know we also do mobile journalism, Vikram sir, and uh, we have always tried to innovate in terms of issues, in terms of processes of news gathering. But I think it's high time that media institutions have to collectively work together. Government has to be far more sensitive. And of course, political parties, political culture has to change and people's voices need to be heard. Well, I, you know, I'm going to come to solutions a little later in this. Um, I don't think I'm going to necessarily hold my breath waiting for politicians, not just not just in India, anywhere in the world. You know, the day if governments change and politicians change and the media changes and they actually all come together, of course, a lot can be done. But I'm not going to be holding my breath. And I also don't think we can necessarily uh, afford to wait, right? How long can we wait for everyone to start recognizing it? So that's 
I am going to be tossing it to everyone to say what are some immediate solutions that we can we can try and find because we waited we waited a long time um, we can and you while you can always hope for the best you should prepare for the worst and I suspect we are reaching that that position now. Uh, Jeshi, uh, let me let me come across to you. Environmental journalists at the Hindustan Times done a lot of uh, excellent work in, in in many of these uh, areas. Uh, let's have your opening thoughts, and then we can all start brainstorming some solutions. Sure, thank you so much, Vikram. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, I have actually made a few points, and I'll touch on some of the points that Bahar also referred to. Um, so. I think the climate crisis uh, story has three dimensions. One is that climate impacts are very severe now and they are touching our lives uh, almost regularly through the monsoon, even other times of the year. The other aspect of the climate crisis story is the global negotiations, uh, the geopolitics side of the climate crisis. And the third uh, dimension is what's being done at home to make India resilient to climate crisis, to make the poor people in India resilient to climate crisis. Now, on the first issue on how, uh, you know, the impacts of climate change are becoming more and more severe, I think there is no dirt of evidence, scientific evidence that we are on the edge of collapse. Uh, if you look at the IPCC uh, reports, there are many high confidence findings. Uh, you know, what, what does high confidence findings mean? It means that uh, the scientific community is very confident that we are going to see these impacts in the next few years. And uh, this would mean more severe events, extreme weather events, of course, uh, you know, very severe monsoon, extreme flooding, all of that. Um, the more recent, uh, the working group two report, which is expected, uh, the IPCC report, which is expected on the 28th of February, that is actually going to talk about tipping points, which is uh, extremely worrying because it's actually talking about how various ecosystems, this includes the Amazon, the monsoons, the boreal forests, all of these are approaching tipping points and if they do tip over in a 1.5 degree scenario then uh, it's catastrophe for many many communities across the globe including india so this is the science side of it i think there is i think climate change has come home and it's no more a story that needs to be spelt out to people because people are feeling it it's just that we are not connecting those dots that's my understanding the second issue is of equity and climate justice, which Bahar referred to. Uh, my personal experience has been uh, that the reporting on climate crisis is very, very skewed. If you if you look at the developing countries, uh, they talk about climate justice and historical responsibility more often than the Western media does. So I remember just top of my head some headlines, for example, how India watered down the uh, the uh, Glasgow Pact by uh, you know introducing. Um, the phase down uh, text and all of that and then uh, the coal phase down text and then later we found out that the coal phase down text was actually from the US uh, China agreement which had happened earlier um, and and the of course you know the parties were aware that and that India would read out uh, this this part of the text so so there are so geopolitics is a reality and uh, I really think um, you know this is a personal opinion I think that the Western media and the Indian media both, uh, I mean the developing, uh, the de media from the developing countries should both refer to equity and justice as much as they can because we cannot wish away historical responsibility. If you look at the graphs, the graphs are very clear uh, that our emissions are rising, China's emissions are also rising, but uh, US, EU um, and the Western nations have been polluting for a for, for very long, which is why we have ended up in this scenario. So while while we want to wish away, we uh, it's not something that we should wish away because the poor people, it, it would be a great injustice to poor people if you do not mention these issues. The third aspect is uh, doing a reality check on what is happening at home in India. Are we actually making the poor people who are the most vulnerable to climate crisis, uh, what Himanshu ji referred to, that if you if you look at when floods happen, it's not our homes that are affected, it's the Kacha homes in Bihar or in some other part of the country which are washed away first. 
that that is again injustice and are we are we doing a reality check of whether we are making these communities resilient or not they may not understand that this is a climate crisis impact but i think that story uh, of joining the dots is what we can do and i'm i'm hoping that i can do that in the coming days just would like to end uh, end my points with you know this story is also about how climate crisis impacts agriculture the forest dwellers the fisheries our coastal communities so so i think in every story if we can go back to who the protagonists are uh, that would also be great so these are just some of my thoughts yeah thank you thank you so much for that uh, uh, jeshri um you know one you you written a book for example an ebook on uh, after the uttarakhand floods on how how that and you use that as a metaphor for some of the changes that can then be brought forward after a disaster maybe that's the sort of communication that we actually need to be able to make a difference uh, if i can in the next 20 25 minutes that we have can what is our job as storytellers as communicators as the media now obviously the governments will do what governments have to do they will negotiate they will negotiate and discuss and say equity and it's our fault and it's not your it's your fault and you know differentiated responsibility and that all the stuff that the government will do what is i think in a sense our job and not just to an echo chamber because i i hate to say this even the fact that all of us are speaking on this panel and perhaps the people who are watching uh, a sustainability summit also tends to be people who are therefore feel strongly about the subject it's not everyone else out there so i think part of our job and our responsibility is to take that message to make sure enough people are hearing the message so that they can then start putting pressure on the politicians to do what needs to be done that's how the change that himanshu was talking about will actually happen if enough people think it is a big enough issue that then suddenly everyone realizes that we better do something about it so fine to that to that point um again coming back to don't look up uh it, it's one thing when you were talking about a comet that was somewhere out there and people were not paying it attention when you could actually see the comet in the night sky it becomes a little more difficult to just brush it under the carpet and pretend that it doesn't exist so what many of the speakers did speak about we are now starting to see the impact on the ground look at the number of disasters that we are seeing almost every year and in virtually every single country it's there in india we are seeing these floods we're seeing the cyclones it's there every year in the united states where you're having major storms one after the other obviously the most vulnerable countries have been confronting it all along but now everyone is seeing it everyone is seeing that there seems to be something strange that is happening and the media does pick that up it's not that the media can't help but talk about it if there's a cyclone or there's flooding or if there's a a major storm somewhere um how can that attention that momentary attention that comes during a climate disaster be used to try and push through lasting change Pan, I'm going to start with you on that, and then throw that same question to everyone else on the panel. Pan, uh, can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yes, I'm. I'm not on a great uh, connection here. I'm not okay. able to use my usual setup, so I, I apologise for uh, my technology not being ideal this morning. Sorry about that. Um, yes. I think the the most important thing uh, there is to start from the science because uh, you know I, I started covering this subject seventeen uh, years ago and at that point it was not possible scientifically to tie particular uh, weather events to climate change. Um, we, we didn't have sufficient uh, knowledge. The 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 uh, the science was was just not su sufficiently advanced at that point to be able to say. Here's a storm. Here's a flood. It's because of climate change. This science, which we call attribution, um, is now much more advanced, and it is now possible to say that the extreme weather that we're seeing in many cases around the world is uh, linked to climate change. It the frequency is increasing owing to climate change, and the intensity, the extremity 
uh, of some of these events is increasing because of climate change. And uh, as uh, uh, I think it was Jeshri mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, produced a report last year and a follow-up report, part two of that report this year, and there'll be another report uh, 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 later in the year synthesizing uh, all of this, which will show very clearly that we can attribute these uh, impacts to climate change. So this is a really important point to come from. Anyone who's covering uh, an extreme weather event, whether that is a, a cyclone or uh, floods or drought, um, should be drawing that connection very clearly because we can, with the science, draw that connection very clearly and say very definitely, these are happening uh, because of climate change. Climate change is making this extreme weather worse and will continue to make it worse in the future if we don't act with urgency. So the very first thing we need to do in any of this reporting is to draw that connection. And I'm afraid that sometimes that still is not happening, uh, which is a surprise. But you know, if we can do that, then people do pay attention to disaster stories. And if people are then being shown that connection, shown that that uh, connection is a matter of scientific evidence and scientific proof, uh, then I think that will start to make a change in people's minds. Right, let me turn to somebody who's actually tried a hand at that. So Jeshri, when you wrote Saving Rani, it's aimed at children four to six years old, it's using the Uttarakhand floods to you know, tell the story what can be done. The fact that you were using a disaster which affected so many people, do you think it's easier to spread that message then and to put out the lessons that you would otherwise have struggled to have communicate? Yes, I actually, uh, you know, ended up writing this very tiny book because I wanted to introduce my daughter to climate change because she asked me why I went to Uttarakhand and what was happening there when the disaster happened. So I was actually trying to see uh, the protagonist in the story is a five year old girl from Uttarakhand who was affected by the flood. And I realized that uh, when you connect it with people, the communication becomes much easier because they, they are the protagonists of the story. They are experiencing it themselves. Having said that, I think there are two sides of the stories. One is that that climate crisis is clearly having an effect on people's lives. The other side is that our infrastructure because of various reasons, be it corruption, be it local governance issues, is not up to the mark to deal with disasters. So if you look at, for the, for example, there are various projects, like for the example, the Chardham project, which is now uh, going on in Uttarakhand, it could make uh, you know many stretches more, more and more vulnerable when there is a disaster related to climate crisis. So I think the two, like, like this uh, climate scientist recently tweeted, Frederick Otto, she tweeted that it's easy to blame uh, climate change on many things, but we also have to understand that our local failures also make us very, very vulnerable. For example, this village, uh, it, it is located, Reni is located very close to the hydroelectric plant, which is, uh, you know, the two hydroelectric plants, which were washed away. So if those hydropower projects were not close to this, uh, you know, heritage village where the Chipko movement started, maybe the village would have survived uh, and may, wouldn't have, uh, now they're considering relocating the village, which is quite a shame uh, considering that Chipko movement started there. So I think both things need to go in, go hand in hand. And when we report, we also need to report on whether there is uh, issues, there are issues with infrastructure, what what is the infrastructure like in these areas? That's that's my feeling. Yeah. All right, uh, Himachal, you were talking about the need to have a change in the mindset in governments, in state actors, in politicians, in political parties, national governments, the media. Do you think that it is going to change almost by itself? Because if, as we all fear, there are going to be more climate-related events taking place it becomes more and more difficult to ignore these things. That's right. It's a complex question you have asked, sir. Actually, this is a work in progress. Uh, remember, we have to see that five years back, the issues that we are deliberating now, uh, there was far less focus on these issues. 
Uh, what is also important to keep in mind is that now we're gradually, as we move towards the post-COVID world, uh, which, which I hope and, and pray that it is emerging finally, uh, the challenge has become manifold. Uh, remember, we will now be moving into a world where hundreds and millions of people have become more poor, hundreds and millions of people have become more hungry, and the entire global effort to actually combat poverty and hunger has considerably weakened in this phase. Uh, and I think, you know, media has to reprioritize its, its focus. Uh, I say this because, remember, during the COVID period, and you understand finance much better than we do, uh, the revenue generation was severely affected of in not only India, but the world at large. And the unprecedented economic contraction that happened, we saw a significant fall in the GST collection, for example, in April was 28,000 crores. It is around 28,000 crores. So the ability of the state to dole out relief and rehabilitation measures uh, to, to fight the impact of climate change, to fight uh, the, the growing poverty and hunger has considerably weakened uh, during the last two years. So what we need to do is once the COVID, we move out of the shadow of COVID-19 pandemic, the media, the government institutions, the political parties, the government at large has to create a new national discourse towards addressing these big challenges that now lie before us. Uh, and I say this because uh, the, the challenge, of course, on the ground continues to rise. If you remember in June, an unprecedented order by the Department of Expenditure was released, which said that we are putting the freezing, the implementation of all new schemes announced in 2020. Remember, the budget 2020 announcements were frozen by the government because they don't have the money to do that. And I, when I was researching, I found that the former Minister of State, Mahesh Sharma, he was repeatedly asked question in Parliament as to how much money does India need actually to fight the impact of climate change? Now, for the first couple of years, there was no response. Finally, I think two years back, uh, one reply came which said that our assessment is that India needs $2.5 trillion to actually help attain the targets that we have set for ourselves. Now, $2.5 trillion is the fund that India needs. This is the government uh, data by Minister of State for, former Minister of State for Environment had tabled in Parliament is a huge sum for a country like India. And of course, from where the fund is going to come, we need to brainstorm on all these issues. Remember, we, India needs yeah. more money. India needs a new politics. India needs a new political culture. We have to sensitize the political parties. Media has to reprioritize its focus. And most importantly, common people have to be mobilized actually to create that national discourse because we have to act at several levels, Vikram sir, to actually address this challenge. Okay. All right, I'm going to start like moving towards possible solutions. So, Bahar, um, okay, look, we all know what we would like to happen. We would like the media and governments and politicians and everyone else to be worrying about how are you changing and how are you working after the global commons and the global code and how can you have meaningful community interventions and how can you have adaptation. That's what we'd like. Um, Am I being cynical if I say that it's not likely to happen by itself because while the disasters and others will draw headlines while they are happening, as soon as that's over, you go back to getting your TRPs and your algorithmic engagement from other things which are nothing to do with this. So you've got to find another solution. Yeah. Well, Vikram, one is to, I think we put uh, too much of an onus on journalists to change the world. Yes, I, I still believe in the power of... You have to tell me that journalists don't change the world? <laughs> I think we have to be realistic. We like to think that, but it doesn't always happen. <laughs> but uh, no, on a more serious note, I think uh, within the realms of journalism, I... I think what needs to be done, and I have three suggestions. One is please start asking the difficult questions. And I feel we don't do enough of that. We're still doing soft namby-pamby journalism. Um, so I think we're not doing enough of that. And what do I mean by that? Um, we don't question the kind of growth that we're going for. And before I get branded as a left activist, uh, I'm neither left nor center nor right. I don't know what political, uh, <laughs> what is my political orientation. But here's uh, here's the thing. 50% of India's infrastructure is yet to be built. Now, that is an opportunity to do things right. It's also going to be disastrous, I think, in many ways for our mountains, our, uh, our rivers and our natural resources. It's going to be absolutely disastrous. We're already seeing it. You know, we are going to have uh, forests and habitats being diverted for big projects. Can we do this the right way? 
And I say this because I want to end on a note of optimism, which is that we are one of the few countries in the world which has fantastic institutions, whether uh, you know it is, it is research-based or it is our judiciary. We're the only ones which have a national green tribunal, which is dedicated, devoted to listening to uh, green issues and giving good decisions on it. I hope they give more and more good decisions on it. So one is that, faith in our institutions, asking the tough questions. Um, the other, and Vikram, I can say this to you now, because uh, you no longer work there and I no longer work in the channel that I used to, so we're no longer rivals. But here was my problem with the tiger thorns and the thorns and the whatever, which is that uh, I did feel that it's very good to get actors and you know do the song and the dance. It's great. We need that. But how do we make behavior change accessible? If behavior change is what we're looking at so that, uh, you know, our, our, our forests are protected, our biodiversity is protected, how do we make that behavior change accessible? And I think that's the kind of information which was not provided. And when I say behavior change, I don't mean the individual using a uh, cloth bag instead of a plastic bag. How do we design our cities better? How do we make waste management as imperative? How do we make sure that composting is absolutely uh, is made mandatory for every household in the city. So I feel that if we can do all these things, if we can make systemic change possible, uh, then we will make some headway. Uh, and lastly, I'll just end with, uh, you know, there was, I do a survey when I teach uh, my students. Uh, so I, I make them go through something called the solutions week, where I give them solutions to climate change. Uh, here's what can be done. Here's what the mayor of Bogota did to tackle, uh, you know, air pollution. Here's how cities are redesigning to make it more accessible for cyclists and to get, uh, you know, individual cars off the street. And even after that, even after weeks of pounding them with positive information, I poll them and I ask them, now tell me, how, do you think the world will make, is, is now ready for climate action? Do you think we'll be able to tackle it in our lifetime? 80% of them said no. So this is after you're giving people the option. So I'm, I'm just saying that there is a climate fatigue which is setting in and that's what we need to counter with our stories. So I'll... I mean, I, I, let, let me just take that a little bit as I, as I toss it to Dr. Shi. But I think part of what you're saying, I and mean, I, I, I agree with you that the real question is around solutions. I think part of the problem is when you're talking about the climate, or you're talking about the environment, you're talking about any of it. Yeah. There's a, when you're talking about water, which is one of the latest campaigns that, that we, for example, are working with Terry very closely on. There's a lot of hand wringing that, oh, it's a problem and this is terrible and it's awful that's happening, right? which is great, but people switch off if you're saying it's a terrible problem and something horrible is about to happen, there's nothing much I can do about it, fine, I'll switch off. The mm -hmm. minute you convert that, as you were saying, into active steps that can be taken, and the active steps aren't necessarily just switch off your tap and, yeah. you know, don't bathe for two weeks, okay. and, because that's not really the solution to a water yeah. problem. There are the solutions which you can find. Find the real realistic solutions and put them out in an accessible manner Absolutely. and make sure enough people are seeing that. That perhaps is the way you're most likely to get a solution. So Dr. Chibber, let me just throw it at you. Now, from the point of view of constructing, whether it's corporates who are communicating their own, uh, their own communications, the good news today is that you no longer need to be going through the mass media route. You don't need to be convincing mass media today to say, why aren't you as a major television channel or a major newspaper or a major whatever, major media behemoth, you need to do ABC. That's not necessary. If you're constructing the solutions in the manner that Bahar was, was just talking about, you do it cleverly and cleverly enough. It can be disseminated to people and policymakers through multiple means because you do have the multiple means. That same social media and other things that we keep trashing and saying, isn't it terrible how they're trivializing matters? Those can be used as a force multiplier once the message is clearly understood and that, that's how you can get information to people. Would you agree with that, that corporates also need to say that if I have to put my money behind something, let's try and find intelligent, new 21st century methods of communicating. Absolutely, absolutely. This is something which is very, very imperative to do in this day. And, and, and I really tell you, there are corporates who are looking at not only the regular 
solutions to it but more innovative solutions to it in terms of also going down to the last mile um i get, uh, i mean if you look at the uh, ideation just just see how um, the entire uh, narration around covid 19 really went and i'll uh because that's something which we're talking about persistently persistently and media has been covering it persistently just see the manner how which you know uh, scrutiny of clinical trials happened scrutiny of people trying to understand the entire ambit around what uh, what how vaccines are going to be developed is really really looked at you look at the fact i mean one day there is a corporate who's trying to come up with a solution through a through a wonder drug and and the media calls it oh wow they've got a wonder drug the day there is a mishap or a, or there is something like an aefi and adverse uh, effect of a drug the same would be termed back to you as something like it's a killer drug don't use it so you know there are numerous instances how corporates are actually you know looking at it and and why not why only see uh, you know environment look at the entire environmental health paradigm itself over the last 2 years the consistent reporting around covid 19 even when it was at a peak or when it is you know delhi dialing at the moment there is still a consistent reporting each and every channel each and every publication each and every web uh, you know analogy is talking about it we've never had an instance in a country or globally when people were looking at so avidly to their uh, you know tv sets or their uh, uh, mobile phones and trying to hear the cdc chief hear the nhs chief or in india hear the icmr or aims uh, chiefs talking about how um, health would have an impact on it people glued into it on a very uh, you know diligent way uh, we we got uh, in fact uh, uh, people you know went to social media and that's where you know i talk uh, bahar talked about it we need to have a behavior change to really look at it look at how people uh, you know showed uh, their uh, vaccine certificates on social media it was something which took them by thrill and that is where we need to really take the entire debate and discourse on climate change also so from from a corporate angle and from a corporate communications angle we do understand that there is enough information around it the information is also tabulated through you know various dialogues that we create um, there are stakeholder round tables there are uh, you know green tables which are now being set up which is which are talking about how green solutions can actually be coming up to um, the first hand information uh, you know one to ones are happening so it's it's not that somebody is not lacking on it it's the consistency and what himanshu ji mentioned or Uh, what even fiona mentioned the consistency that needs to really um, be talked about over and above, over again so i i i'm really a believer that media needs to take a pivotal role in disseminating information following it up also dis- uh, diligently and also providing an analysis analysis of many complex issues that are really impaired so it's it's not one solution that you have we have to as fiona said have all solutions put it in a bucket and have it thrown to everyone else right uh, himan sure I, I, I we start running out of time i'm going to maybe get final thoughts from 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 all of you so himan sure to take bahar's point forward where i think some of the major campaigns that it was save the tiger or the greenathon or swachh bharat or many of them where i think part of the them were, were very effective when it became down to the specific solutions that individuals can do here's what you can do here's what a state government can do if you want to save the tiger this is what you as the chief minister of you know uttarakhand can do this is what you as the chief minister of karnataka can do when it comes down to those action points that sometimes the way in which that message is the most effective would you agree with that absolutely sir i mean remember when when there was a national debate and there was concern all around that the number of tiger is gradually declining and then we saw media houses across the the spectrum uh they started highlighting these issues and that's the time when you did series of campaigns and i remember even as a political journalist i myself uh went to at least two sanctuaries and we shot at least three four documentaries there talking to people the role to people living in jungles in sanctuaries and how gradually that created lots of policy action i remember interviewing jaram ramesh during those days a uh, several times and every day he would be meeting with state environment ministers giving directives issuing circulars advisories 
there was a national effort to save the tiger. And that got reflected in media very appropriately. And you're absolutely right that we need to have such targeted and focused media coverage on issues. We have to not talk about, let's say, okay, so we have to save the planet, so let's fight climate change. You have to just deconstruct that how climate change is affecting our lives. And let's say once you can focus on the coastal districts, for example. Now, the NASA data shows that the sea levels are rising with global warming, the glaciers are melting. So how far those areas, which are believed to have reported a rise, let's say, in sea temp surface temperature of the sea or even the rise in sea levels, how are the islands disappearing? Sundarbans, for example, lots of debate happening. So we need to have those targeted, even when you're talking about, let's say, the impact, the global warming impact on the, on the ocean, for example, you have to have specific targeted uh, responses from people. Because remember, it's a long, long effort that we need. We have to keep working hard for many, many years to create that discourse, create new policies, new laws, to engage more and more people in every part of the world. And that was going to take many, many years, but a beginning has to be made. And you're absolutely right. The more targeted and focused the media's attention on an issue is, I think better desired result will come. We can engage more people in that process. Sir. All right, Jayashree, final quick thought from you. How are we going to win the communication battle and hence save the planet? Yeah, okay, that's a tall ask. <laughs> And you have 30 seconds in true okay. journalistic fashion. You have 30 seconds to give me the solution. I'm Save the planet hard, now. Hard stories. Uh, I'm going to go with Bahar. I'm going to report on hard stories. And I think a lot of things are going wrong in terms of policy within India. When you say ease of doing business is more important than the way clearances are issued, I think that should worry all of us. And I think more uh, sort of doing hard stories, doing a reality check of how mining is affecting the forests in central India and how infrastructure projects are affecting, say, Himalayas. All these stories will be very, very important in ensuring that we are able to deal with some of the impacts of climate change. Right. Fiona, could your 30 second version of how you win the communication wars and save the planet? Easy peasy. Um, what we need to do is reassure people that actually uh, saving the planet is a good thing and worth doing. Because sometimes I think people are worried that, you know... I can't uh, believe you have, have to, to tell people that. I, I can't believe we have to convince people that saving the planet is a good thing. On balance, yeah. it's better if we have a planet than if we don't. In, in the sense that some people are worried that the economy will uh, collapse if we try to save the planet. Some people are worried that, you know, if we don't continue to uh, pick, uh, to base our economy on fossil fuels, then it will be incredibly expensive uh, to move to other forms of, of uh, energy and so on. It won't be. Um, we do have the technology. We can have a green future and it will be uh, you know, it, it will be cheap. We've seen the cost of renewable energy come down massively over the past two decades um, to an extent that no one would have predicted. Um, you know, we've seen it, uh, uh, India embrace renewable energy to an extent that no one would have predicted and other countries all around the world doing so. Um, we've seen how health can be improved by moving to cleaner forms of energy, um, by reducing air pollution uh, and so on. Health can be improved by eating a, a better diet that's based on healthier food and so on that is uh, kinder to the climate. Um, so we can actually have a, a cleaner, brighter, healthier, cheaper, uh, more just, uh, more equitable future if we want it um, without uh, destroying uh, you know, the, the things that people enjoy in their lifestyles at the moment um, and without destroying people's aspirations uh, to leave poverty. So we can do all of these things, but we need to do them incredibly quickly because we've been moving far too slowly up till now. And I'm afraid the climate cannot wait. Right. Bahar, one line quickly from you. I think we're running out of time. Well, I think uh, a good story is about avoiding doom and gloom which typically happens in climate change. And lastly, I think a good story should have good science, yes, but it should also tell the individual story, uh, the individual emotion. So a balance of emotion with good practical science, I think makes for good storytelling for the planet. Okay. Dr. Chipper, just 10 seconds. Yeah, so um, for me, from a communications point of view, I would say that 
the goal is neither to create headlines nor to have an immediate news story but it should be all created in such a typically sound way with sound in, uh, scientific evidence that media serves as change agents that we want to see basically right so we've heard from all the panel the, the the experts out here if i had to add something to that or to, to recap a lot of what we've come up with yes you need to find a way of breaking out of the idea of the echo chambers there's no point only talking to environmentalists make sure that the message goes out to the to the public to governments to policy makers make sure it gets to them make sure that there are solutions that are actually provided so people know what it is that they can actually do to make a difference to to saving the planet instead of just saying there's a problem and nothing can be done about it tell them what the specific solutions are and yes let's recognize that it is the 21st century it is 2022 and therefore there are other methods that can be used to make those communications that are not the same old linear pipeline methods of having to rely on mass media to communicate there are other more exciting ways of doing it or equally exciting ways of doing it right now we must use every possible chance that we can thank you all so much for joining us on this really really interesting panel amir i'm going to toss it back to you thank you Thank you, Mr. Vikram Chandra. Thank you again for sharing the session. We had a really great discussion and I would like to thank all the speakers for giving key points and a, a broad framework on the way forward for communication uh, and on shaping public and uh, political perceptions on climate action. So thank you again for your inputs. A really valuable discussion. Um, and uh, just a key um, note for the audience and the participants, uh, I would request you to stay on as we will now break out into seven thematic sessions uh, given in the breakout rooms. So this is a note for the audience. And again, thank you speakers for taking our time to give uh, your uh, valuable inputs today. Thank you all so much.